Hi, good evening everyone. So welcome to the pre-recorded lecture. Now, I'm going to get straight to it. The topic is correlating histological structure with physiological function for a better understanding of microanatomy. Okay. Now, the most important question that a lot of students ask me is, uh, sir, there's already cross anatomy to do, there's neuroanatomy, there's embryology. We don't really get enough time for histology. And I completely relate with that. Uh, if you've really been attending your histology practicals and you've paid attention and you've been very serious about completing your journals on time, which is a very rare phenomenon, by the way, uh, then the overall pressure is really less when the exams come as close as they are right now for you guys. So, uh, one of the best ways of dealing with this crisis is uh, something that I refer to as fast reading. Now, you can't really expect to be reading extremely slow when you are at this stage, correct? So, I would like to assume that you at least read 60 to 70 percent of the textbook at least once whenever it was being taught. Okay, if you just showed up for this talk right now, uh, I don't think you're going to take home uh, a lot of points with you. But if you've been somebody who's an average student when it comes to attendance and paying attention, then you would probably understand what I'm talking about. This is a very informal lecture. It's not going to be bombarding you with actual information. What I'm going to talk about is just a perspective of understanding a few topics and applying the knowledge that you earn in some other topics okay uh, what you can see here is on the left side is a special stain and uh, you don't usually see it in your classrooms it's called the mason strike room and what it has been used for is the glomerulus and you can see a couple of renal tubules by the side okay and on the right side, what you see is a physiological schematic diagram of the same. Where you can see a glomerulus, uh, you can see the Bowman's capsule, the parietal and the visceral layer. And what the physiological studies of glomerulus would suggest is that it is a tissue where exchange takes place. Right? So, if you understand that wherever simple exchanges, when I say simple, I'm speaking more of diffusion, no active processes involved. Wherever simple exchanges take place, the epithelium is usually squamous and flat. Okay. Another example that comes to mind is the loop of Henle. And another one is lung alveoli. Okay. So, let's keep that at the back of our mind and progress further. The aims and objectives today are, we're going to have a holistic approach to the knowledge of microanatomy. When I say holistic approach, the lecture is not going to deal with multiple points that you have to mug up and remember. It's going to give you a basic wisdom about how to approach a certain kind of tissue when you're studying it. And how knowing a little bit about what the function of that tissue is, gives you an insight into why the structure would be in a certain way. I'm going to start off by talking about the tissues in the human body. It's just going to be a quick recap. Literally, I'm going to be reading out of the index of your histology textbook. Then I'm going to speak about the organ systems in the human body. Then we get to the main part of the lecture. And that is the structure function correlation. And I'm just going to use four examples. I'm going to use the example of a proximal convoluted tubule cell describe in detail its structure and why the structure is the way it is and that is because of its function then i'm going to speak of an exocrine gland chiefly i'm going to speak about the salivary glands then we could probably just get into the differences between mucus and serous but that's not really the crux of the topic then i'm going to speak a little bit about an endocrine gland and the example I'm going to use is the islets of Langerhans. And finally, I'm going to speak about a general schema of the gastrointestinal tract and how the structure has subtle changes according to the function of that part of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, I was also going to speak about thymus, but 
when I did a rough demo, I realized that we are not having enough time for thymus. So I decided not to speak about thymus. It's a very interesting topic and if you guys love this lecture and if it kind of makes you feel like you want more, then I could definitely deal into some of your favorite subjects that you want a video on. Uh, but again, I can't promise if they would be coming out before your exams because I'm occupied with a lot of other things. So uh, eventually I'm just going to summarize everything. Okay. So let's go ahead. Before I even start, I'm going to get a little philosophical and talk about the difference between knowledge and information. Just take a screenshot. I'm not going to read this out. But the last line really hits home. We have access and can find information about anything, but a huge amount of information available to us doesn't make us more knowledgeable. And the reason why I say this is that you could have a lot of information stored in your head by repetition and constant mugging. And uh, that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's great. But if you cannot apply what you learn, if you cannot associate one region of your brain with another, then it's not really going to be as useful. Uh, in my humble opinion, the definition of intelligence is to associate two different things together and make some sense out of it in the least possible time. So, this lecture is going to help you in applying perspective and hopefully make you a little more knowledgeable after you read what I tell you to read after the lecture. Okay, so I'm going to tell you to read a lot of things, uh, not exactly a lot of things as in, in bulk, but I want you to go through many topics as soon as this lecture is over. Maybe it'll take two hours for you to quickly just read a uh, little paragraphs here and there, uh, assuming that you've already read them at least once. Okay. So I'm going to wait here for a moment. If you haven't already, please take a pen or a pencil, take a paper. Okay. Every time I say write this down, write it down. Just add a question mark to it. And once the lecture is over, open your textbooks and start reading and finding out the answers. Okay. The whole point of this lecture is not to teach you, but to inculcate amongst you a sense of curiosity to want to know more about histology. Okay. So tissues in the human body. I'm sure you all know that tissues are actually a bunch of cells that have gathered together. Uh, to perform a specialized or a common function. The first thing that you study in the academic year is epithelium and glands. I'm not going to get into the definition of epithelium, but you basically know that it lines the surfaces, right? Lines surfaces and it lines the internal tubular structures, the luminal aspect of things, okay? So, this is a very basic classification and the reason why I just got this table here is that I'm going to speak a little bit about every epithelium and just tell you one example of each and hopefully you can identify some other examples okay squamous epithelium we already went through in the beginning of the presentation flat most commonly seen in as i said glomerulus yes lung alveoli yes and of course endothelium of blood vessels right and mesothelium that lines the body cavities which is essentially the visceral peritoneum then we've got cuboidal right cuboidal now the height of a cuboidal cell may vary depending upon whether there is any secretory function associated with it. for example in the follicular cell of the thyroid gland uh, if the thyroid is actively in an active state basically then it becomes a tall cuboidal or a low columnar cell but in a resting thyroid it becomes low cuboidal right in certain other examples such as ducts of exocrine glands. Now here the cuboidal epithelium is just serving the purpose of lining a tube so that the secretions that are passing through it can go from one end to the other. So here it's not really actively synthesizing a lot. What you do need to remember though is that especially in exocrine glands as the ductular system or the tubular system starts getting bigger the cuboidal cells start forming multiple layers. So larger ducts such as lobar and interlobar ducts are usually stratified cuboidal, while the smaller ones like the intralobular duct will be simple cuboidal. Okay, then columnar 
<clears throat> now this is a typical columnar cell without specialization but mostly we have these examples of specializations for example a pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium is a hallmark feature of the respiratory epithelium right why pseudo because the nuclei are at multiple levels and in the respiratory tree especially there are small little cells at the base that are known as basal stem cells and these act as stem cells and can eventually give rise to the newer cells which might turn out to form one of the other variants here so the <clears throat> overall pseudo appearance is because the nuclei are at multiple levels because of this situation and of course the cilia help in what is known as mucociliary clearance right then secretory tall columnar cells sometimes have modifications like what you see here is a goblet cell where the mucopolysaccharides that are formed are bulky so they eventually lead to the formation of a goblet and then you have a typical absorptive enterocyte or a cell of the small intestine where the apical aspect is thrown into folds to increase the surface area of absorption which is known as microvilla you also see this in the gallbladder okay in stratified squamous you have non-keratinizing which can be seen lining the inner surfaces of esophagus, anal canal and the keratinizing variety which is seen in the cases of thick and thin skin. Then stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar like I said would be seen in the larger dots. And finally the most important epithelium for examiners transitional epithelium or uroepithelium. See what's happening here? The topmost cells are not flattened like stratified squamous but in fact they are bigger these are known as umbrella cells and another hallmark feature of these cells is polyploidy and transitional epithelium is known for two things first its ability to stretch and secondly uh, it has tight junctions or desmosomes and that is a modification so that the things that lie within the lumen of urinary tubules which is which contains toxins need not seep out on the other side so the tight junctions basically prevent and leaking of whatever lies inside so there is absolutely no reabsorption happening here okay so that's one of the important features of transitional epithelium so here's a couple of things i want you to find out as soon as the lecture is over a examples of each of these types just write them down all right then one of the most commonly asked questions is what are the characteristic features of transitional epithelium come up with at least four points okay very commonly asked question in the practical bible okay now these are the other kinds of tissues but i'm not going to get into the details of that okay connective tissue connects one kind of tissue to the other now you'll see connective tissue broadly classified into loose areola and dense connective in loose areola everything is lying loosely while in dense it has a more systematic pattern in which it is arranged so the former would lead to a slight flexibility for the two types of tissues that it's connecting an example is lamina propria so lamina propria is as you know uh, the layer just lying under the lining epithelium of the gastrointestinal tract and the lamina propria is rich in capillaries but because it is not densely arranged there is a slight amount of flexibility that the lining epithelium enjoys okay on the contrary dense connective tissue that is seen in things such as aponeurosis and tendon are actually arranged in a specific way to create characteristic strength and stability to the tissues to which it connects right and when it comes to connective tissues you also need to read a little bit more about cells so here's a couple of cells that i want you to read about read about the fibroblast read about the adipocyte then in the intercellular substance i want you to read about all the three types of fibers collagen elastin and reticulin try to understand collagen is mostly used for its tensile strength elastin of course for its elasticity and reticulin is a very interesting kind of connective tissue fiber which is predominantly seen in lymphoid organs okay then of course there's intercellular substance uh, which contains proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans that's more of a biochemistry topic uh, do read about it though because a lot of uh, 
specializations that take place in connective tissue are actually because of specializations in the intercellular substance. For example, in cartilage, there is more water holding capacity in the ground substance. In bone, there is mineralization that occurs in the intercellular substance, so on and so forth. Okay. Blood is a physiology topic. Lymphatic tissue is a completely separate lecture. I'm not even going to think about talking about it today. Same for muscle and nervous tissue. Muscle tissue characterized for the act of contraction. So I want you to read a little bit about actin and myosin. Write this down. Actin, myosin, coupling. The teacher usually tells you to draw that diagram. So please draw that block diagram with actin and myosin and how because you might think that you know how to draw it, but when you actually start drawing it in front of the teacher, you might end up making a few mistakes. You don't want to do that because it's an easy slide. You don't want to not be able to draw a typical muscle tissue, the sarcomere, the Z-disc, all that. Please read about it. It's very important. Now, nervous tissue is again something that I would not like to talk about at all today, uh, but please read it also from the initial part of your neuroanatomy textbook because a lot of things in nervous histology would eventually also go to a neuroanatomy viva like what are microglial cells uh, what are astrocytes okay are you writing these things down please do okay now all the organ systems in the human body are essentially a beautiful mix and match of all the tissues that we study so after you're done with your general histology and if it's really good you can start applying all these different tissues and how they coalesce together to form an organ and how each of these contribute to the functions of the organ right for example skin the epithelium is stratified squamous but if you see it has five the epidermis has five layers and all these five layers show a slight change in morphology of the cell Right? So I have a slide of epidermis which I want to show to you. It's a very commonly asked question. Uh, next, in the cardiovascular system, again, there's going to be the endothelial lining, below which there's going to be subendothelial connective tissue, also known as the lamina propria. Then we've got the muscle tissue, and the muscle tissue is so important in defining uh, the artery. Suppose uh, it's a muscular artery, there'll be more smooth muscle fibers in the muscle layer. In an elastic artery, there's going to be more elastin fibers in the tunica media okay so that is how you can now start applying these individual tissues and how they make a difference in the overall structure of an organ system gastrointestinal symptom what a beautiful combination of most of the tissues that you study in general first you've got your lining epithelium which will be different in different parts of the gastrointestinal tract as we shall discuss ahead then the lamina propria then the submucosa, submucosa is a little more dense, so it's not exactly loose areolar tissue. There's a certain arrangement of the fibers, connected tissue fibers, to form a more uh, solid structure. Then also we have so many glands. Some of the glands will be smaller in the lamina propria. Some will be bigger glands in the submucosa. Esophagus, write this down. Esophagus, for example, is a structure where the glands extend all the way down into the submucosal level. Then we've got muscularis mucosa and we've also got muscularis externa, which is again muscle tissue. There's a circular layer outside which there's a longitudinal layer. The circular layer usually helps in uh, mixing, local mixing and churning, while the longitudinal layer helps in the wave of peristalsis propagated from the oral end to the anal end okay then respiratory system once again the epithelium is pseudo stratified uh, columnar ciliated epithelium you have the basal stem cells and a very interesting observation with the respiratory epithelium is as you start descending or uh, going from the larynx to the alveolus in the bronchial tree the epithelium starts becoming shorter 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 until it becomes completely squamous and the level of the lung alveoli where actual disease exchange takes place correct uh, similarly <clears throat> the muscle layer of uh, the respiratory tree also starts becoming thinner and thinner and thinner until it completely disappears at the alveolar stage okay urinary system another topic for another day but do remember transitional epithelium very commonly asked 
below transitional epithelium you're going to have a little bit of lamina propria and once again the muscle system where there's going to be a circular layer and there's going to be a longitudinal layer uh, of course when you study kidney histology in particular at time there's a couple of interesting things out of which i already discussed a little bit about glomerulus uh, but there's also the proximal convoluted tubule which i'm going to speak a little bit about as an example of specialization in the cell okay then we have the reproductive system the endocrine system uh, in the endocrine system i have one example of uh, the pancreas uh, the islets of Langerhans which is the endocrine part of the pancreas which I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, central nervous system organs that perceive special senses so these are all the organ systems that you should be familiar with I think that in special senses retina and cornea are extremely important and uh, they are something that does need a lot of mugging up so uh, good luck with that Okay, the epidermis is an example of stratified squamous epithelium. But let's have a closer look at what exactly is happening as we go from below upwards. Okay, the first layer is known as stratum basalis or it is also known as stratum germinativum. Okay, now if you were to describe every layer or the cell of every layer, how will you describe it? Whenever in the practical way, anybody asks you to describe a cell, you need to have a proforma at the back of your head. First, start by talking about the shape of the cell. Okay, please write these things down. How to describe a cell? Point number one, shape. Is it pyramidal? Is it circular? Is it cuboidal? Is it flat? Okay. Next, you talk about the nucleus and then the cytoplasm. So when you're speaking about the nucleus, there's only two things you can do. You can either say it's a hyperchromatic nucleus or a hypochromatic nucleus. If it's a hyperchromatic nucleus, that means that it is not an actively synthesizing cell because the nucleus has DNA inside it. And every time there is an active production of something inside the cell, parts of the DNA have to unfold and whenever the DNA unfolds, it leads to a slight paler color, hence the term open face nucleus or euchromatic nucleus. If it's a cell that is not actively synthesizing anything, the nucleus is going to be nice and dark and that is known as heterochromatic nucleus. Okay. Now, a couple of examples that come to mind are a cartwheel nucleus. Do you know where you see a cartwheel nucleus? It's seen in what is known as a plasma cell. Now, a plasma cell is essentially an activated B lymphocyte that creates certain proteins that are known as immunoglobulins, which we commonly call antibodies. So, in the example of a plasma cell, certain parts of the DNA are unwound and certain parts are wound because of which it gives to this characteristic spoke wheel appearance and thus that is a characteristic nucleus of a plasma cell a cartwheel nucleus but moving back over here to describe a cell if you were to describe the cell of stratum basalis just say one it is tall you can say columnar as well two the nucleus is euchromatic because these are actively multiplying cells so the nucleus will always be an open face nucleus right a actively secreting and synthesizing cell or an actively multiplying cell usually shows an open face nucleus. Next, speak about the cytoplasm. Now, the cytoplasm usually has basophilic granules. In fact, here you can see that most of the granules over here are actually melanin pigments that are created by another cell called melanocyte and absorbed by these cells. So tall columnar, open face nucleus, basophilic cytoplasm showing some melanin pigment granules that's the typical description of stratum basalis if we move on this little word here already reveals so much about the cell stratum spinosum the cell is known as a spinous cell because the cells of stratum spinosum are attached to each other by desmosomes or tight junctions but during the process of tissue processing because of dehydration the cell shrinks in size except at the points where the tight junctions have attached to each other thus giving it a typical spinous appearance hence the name stratum spinosum as we move upward to the third layer 
this is known as stratum granulosum now stratum granulosum because it has certain granules which you can see all around the cell okay now check out the shape of the cell it's not tall it's slightly more polyhedral and all around the nucleus you can see these keratohyalin granules and when you move upwards certain changes start occurring in the cells now the nucleus starts becoming smaller and smaller and eventually it becomes pycnotic okay please read about what a pycnotic nucleus is and eventually the nucleus completely disappears because the final layer is acellular it's just flakes of keratin and how is this keratin formed it is formed because these keratohyalin granules are exocytose and keratin fibers line themselves across the outside surface okay so that's your stratum lucidum and stratum corneum so if you observe there is a change in the morphology of the cell as you go from base to the apex area and every little change in the cell is reflective of what exactly is happening physiologically inside the cell okay so that is important okay i hope you've written down how to describe a cell talk about the shape talk about the nucleus talk about the cytoplasm is it basophilic is it uh, acidophilic speak about granules sometimes you might have to speak about certain organelles that are more in abundance in certain cells for example a cell where there is active transport happening would be having a lot of mitochondria because you need energy for the active processes okay more on that later so let's move on to the next slide okay now the transverse section of a blood vessel what you can see here is an artery this is actually a medium sized muscular artery and what you can see here is a vein now everybody knows the difference between artery and vein there's a table go through it i'm not going to speak about all those basic things in the lecture what i want to talk to you about is how to describe a vessel the best way to do it is by going within outwards right so you need to start layer by layer always remember start with the endothelium when you talk about the endothelium same principle it's a flat squamous cell okay the nucleus can be seen slightly bulging out and the reason for this uh, almost always is because an endothelium is not a simple cell where only exchange is taking place it's slightly more complicated than that so i want you to go and read about all the properties or characteristic features of endothelium note that down okay there's a synthesis of so many pro thrombotic and anti thrombotic factors like von willebrand factor for example factor 8 i think if i'm not mistaken uh there are so many other receptors that are expressed in an endothelium which help in the migration of the cells from the intravascular to the extravascular compartment for example in case of an inflammatory response if a leukocyte has to travel from within the lumen to the site of inflammation then the endothelium has the responsibility of expressing receptors so that the leukocytes adhere to that and then they are transported outside so the endothelium is not just any other flat squamous cell but it's a specialized cell so whenever you get the slide of a blood vessel your viva almost always starts with enumerate the properties of endothelium so read about endothelium then you've got the subendothelial connective tissue which is like a thin layer of lamina propria always remember underneath a lining epithelium you almost always have loose areolar connective tissue almost always right so that's just going to be a couple of loose fibers lying around and then you have tunica media and the tunica media consists of in this case predominantly smooth muscle fibers in case of an elastic artery like the aorta there is more elastin fibers and in case of a muscular artery there is very less elastin fibers which means that as you go distal from the heart the elasticity reduces and that's got everything to do with what is known as elastic recoil so you read about elastic recoil in physiology and that's why you'll understand that the proximal you are to the heart the more are the elastin fibers the distal you go the muscle uh, fibers the smooth muscle fibers start increasing now these smooth muscle fibers again are having some special features which have a great role to play in what is known as angiogenesis and uh, the formation of atheromatous plaques you read about it okay tunica media of a vessel wall a topic that would be really trending because atheromatous plaques is one of the most important pathophysiological changes that leads to coronary heart disease right 
so it's an examiner's favorite and of course talk about the internal elastic lamina which is more prominent in case of the muscular arteries and then finally you have the tunica adventitia which is predominantly collagen fibers and uh, nervi vasorum and vasa vasorum okay read about all these things when you're describing a vein you already know the differences the media is not going to be as prominent and as thick and the adventitia is going to be a little more uh, thicker in case of the vein right uh, a few important things that they really ask about is what are post capillary venules write that down what are high endothelial venules now this is a good one please please read about this high endothelial venules then they always ask you about capillaries so one of the most common questions is fenestrated capillaries and sinusoids okay enumerate the sites where there are fenestrated capillaries one of the most common examples is endocrine glands and enumerate organs where there are sinusoids now one of the most important examples of sinusoids is liver the hepatic sinusoids so read a little more about these uh, alterations in capillaries right also read about the pericyte p-e-r-i-c-y-t-e -E. it's an important cell that they ask about and some other things like arteriovenous shunts okay right so i'm going to move on to the next slide now okay so now i'm going to talk about four examples where structure and functional correlation can be used very well the first is a cell i'm going to describe which is known as the proximal convoluted tubule the cell of the proximal convoluted tubule and it would be important that you know what exactly happens here so i hope you've read renal physiology the next thing i'm going to speak about is an exocrine gland uh, I'm just going to tell you the structure, a typical structure of a, of an exocrine gland and then just slightly differentiate between the acidness of a mucus and a serous salivary gland. Then we'll speak a little bit about the schema of the gastrointestinal tract in general. Again, not a lot of details. Then finally, we'll speak about an endocrine gland and the example I've taken is the islet of Langerhans in the pancreas. Okay. Now, let's talk about the proximal convoluted tubule you know that a lot of urine that is collected in the Bowman's capsule eventually is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule right and these processes sodium glucose certain amino acids which are reabsorbed are all active processes and this is what a proximal convoluted tubule looks like Okay, and if you take one of these cells out, if you take one of these cells out over here, this is the electron microscopic uh, diagram of a proximal convoluted tubule. Let's discuss as we always do. Point number one, shape. You'd say it's columnar or you'd say it's tall cuboidal, right? Next, nucleus. Can you see? There's not a lot of black here, so it's an euchromatic nucleus, which means it's an active cell. And if you observe, you have basal striations. That is the basal aspect of the cell has gone into folds. Now, just like in an enterocyte, you've got apical folds, microvilli, which you obviously see here as well. Can you see them? These are all microvilli. This is more of a three-dimensional part. Okay, so just concentrate on the apical aspect over here. So these are the microvilli, the apical side, and these are the basal enfoldings. And all these black long things are actually mitochondria. So a lot of active exchanges are taking place along the basal aspect of the proximal convoluted tubule cell. Hence you need so many mitochondria, right? So similarly, if you want to speak about maybe the hepatocyte, you'd speak about how the hepatocyte has phagolysosomes because detoxification is one of the important functions in a hepatocyte how the hepatocyte has smooth endoplasmic reticulum because lipid metabolism chiefly occurs in hepatocytes so try to understand that biochemical processes which take place in organelles would be more predominant in those type of cells where these processes occur another example i can think about is just think about uh, the interstitial cells of lady the interstitial cells of lady will be having 
a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Why? Because what they secrete, that is testosterone, is a steroid hormone. If you have a cell that is secreting a steroid hormone, of course you're going to have the organelle where lipid synthesis takes place. And lipid metabolism takes place. That's your smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So learn to apply your cells like that. Think about a cell and try to understand that the reason why certain organelles are more in these cells is directly pointing out to the function that is occurring across the cell. Do you get that? So what the examiner really expects from you is has this person understood what to remember in this cell? And the moment you say that answer, they get really happy because they know that you're applying yourselves and that's what it's all about. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now salivary glands. Again, you know that glands can either be predominantly serous like the parotid, predominantly mucous like the sublingual, or they can be mixed like uh, the submandibular gland. Right. The most commonly asked question here is the difference between a serous and a mucous acinus, which I will get back to. But eventually, this is what you are used to looking at. Right. This is what you think of when you look at a salivary gland. This is what you draw. Let's just change the perspective a little and see what it looks like in a three-dimensional format. Understanding this might probably give you a better perspective about what exactly is happening when a section is cut like that. Okay. So whenever you think of a salivary gland, or for any gland for that matter, I want you to think of a bunch of grapes. The grape is the secretory end piece. Like the name suggests, it's going to secrete something. So automatically the epithelium is going to become pyramidal or tall columnar. Okay? And eventually the secretory end piece secrete into the lumen and the lumen eventually leads to the ductular system. And you can think of the ductular system as the brown twigs on which the grapes are attached okay see what's happening here the height of the epithelium is now reducing as you go from the secretory end piece towards the duct sometimes you have an intermediate stage which is known as a central assigner cell it's commonly seen more in the pancreatic asini but anyway uh tall columnar epithelium now you've got cuboidal epithelium as the multiple ducts joined to form a larger duct let's call this like an interlobar duct then can you see the layers are increased now this is two layer thick two layers of cuboidal epithelium and this is actually an interlobular but as it becomes more and more bigger as more uh, secretory end pieces and more interlobular ducts join it becomes an interlobar duct which will have three or four layers of not only cuboidal but columnar epithelium right and you see all these things these are all the connective tissue fibers and see how they intertwine like that okay and look at that that's actually another intertwining cell which is actually a myoepithelial cell when the myoepithelial cells contract the grape will squeeze and the grape juice will come out into the duct okay so this is what a three-dimensional representation looks like but in two dimensions this is what you see so of course the darkly stained things are going to be sections that are taken like this. Why darkly stained? Because there are granules. Now, these granules are going to be stained. Okay. If they're going to be basophilic granules, they'll be staining more purplish. If they're going to be acidophilic granules, they're going to be staining more dark pink. But they're definitely going to give a darker color, which is why the best way to differentiate between a secretory end piece and a duct is that a duct is going to be much more fainter. There is no granules in the cuboidal epithelium of the ducts. Okay. That's how you differentiate between an acinus and a duct the epithelium as well as the color moving on surrounding all these is going to be your connective tissue fibers which you see here in light green but they'll be obviously seen as little little strands all around okay it's mostly going to be collagen in case of uh, exocrine glands then this is a larger duct now this is a larger duct so you can see multiple layers here do you see that this is a blood vessel okay so if you see in this section a myo epithelial cell just occurs as a little extra cell somewhere in a corner just flattened okay but these are also known as stellate cells because they are kind of stellate in appearance and they just surround the entire secretory end piece in this format okay now once you understand what exactly is happening let's move on to the differences in high power between a serous and a mucinous acinus very commonly asked question right now this is parroted 
salivary gland. You can see all these dark granules. They're on the apical side. Look at how the shape is. Okay, it's pyramidal in shape. You've got a nice open nucleus because of course, actively synthesizing things. These granules are essentially formed because there is active uh, protein synthesis happening. Correct? So this is what a typical serous sinus looks like and you can see two myopithelial cells in the background. This is what a typical intercalated duct looks like. This is a striated duct. Now, remember we spoke about basal striations in the proximal convoluted tubule. Similarly, even in the striated duct of a salivary gland, there are basal infoldings and there are mitochondria over there. This is to increase the surface area and the fact that there is mitochondria means there are certain things that are being exchanged even in the duct. Usually exchanges do not happen in a duct, but this is one of those exceptions, the striated duct of the salivary gland where exchanges take place. Certain ions like potassium, certain uh, immunoglobulins and lysozyme is actually exchanged in the duct here okay as opposed to this look at what a mucinous acinous looks like it's light in color and this is because mucopolysaccharides are lighter in color and most of the times they are lost in the process of tissue processing and see what's happening to the nucleus it's flattened and it's at the base look this is a circular nucleus because these granules are small and darkly staining on the other hand these granules are huge almost transparent and they push the nucleus to the base hence a mucinous acinous has these flattened nuclei which are supposed to be drawn at the base so many journal corrections so many journals have been returned to people because they haven't got this raw they haven't gotten this right so please get it right when it's asked in the exam because the teacher will actually tell you to draw that okay now this is a serous demilume in certain mucinous acini there is a slight element of serous secretions they just help in um, adding a certain uh, liquidy feel to the otherwise uh, viscous mucus secretions. That is the function of a serous demilium. You see that? Everything else pretty much remains the same. So, in salivary glands, some of the most common questions asked are differentiate between serous and mucus acinus, talk about the myopithelial cells, describe in detail the duct system speak about the intercalated and the striated ducts and of course another question they commonly ask is the similarities and the differences between a serous salivary gland and pancreas okay now in pancreas you're going to have certain light uh, islands which are known as islets of langer and so that you won't see in a parotid gland on the other hand in the parotid gland there is more connective tissue as compared to the pancreas okay Right. There's a couple more differences that you should really study. Okay, differences between serous salivary gland and the parotid gland. Let's move on to the general schema of the gastrointestinal tract. Again, let's go from within outwards. First, you have what is known as the mucosa, and the mucosa consists of the lining epithelium, under which you have the loose areolar connective tissue of the lamina propria, under which you have a circular and a longitudinal muscle coat, which is belonging strictly to the mucosa hence the name muscularis mucosa okay then we've got the sub mucosa as you can see in light blue over here okay in the lamina propria you're going to have capillaries you're going to have some lymph nodes some lacteals etc now in the sub mucosa there are sub mucus glands the two important examples where sub mucus glands are seen is esophagus and in the duodenum, these are known as Brunner's gland. Okay, B-R-U-N-N-E-R-S, Brunner's gland. Please note that down. Okay, then the submucosa is also going to have vessels, but they're going to be slightly larger capillaries as compared to the lamina propria. Try to understand that whatever you eat is absorbed by the enterocyte from there. At the basal aspect of the enterocyte, it goes into the capillary system. Then these smaller capillaries eventually joined to form bigger capillaries and vessels which will be in the submucosa correct then outside of the submucosa you have the next layer which is known as the muscularis externa so that you do not confuse it with the muscularis mucosa and the muscularis externa consists of an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer okay now understand this 
Between the circular muscle coat and the submucosa, you have the submucosal plexus, which is also known as the Meissner's plexus. And between the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle, you have the myenteric plexus, also known as Auerbach's plexus. Auerbach. I don't know how to pronounce it, but you get the point. Okay? So, the circular muscle coat, which at certain regions, such as the pylorus, form a thickening to form the pyloric sphincter. And the longitudinal muscle coat, which essentially helps in the transmission of the wave of peristalsis. In certain regions like the large intestine, it undergoes modifications to form the tinea coli. And finally, you've got the last layer that is the serosa. Now, if it is an organ to which the visceral peritoneum is attached, then you have a mesothelial lining. Otherwise, if it's a bare area where there is no peritoneum, it's just going to be a connective tissue layer with mostly collagen fibers. Okay. So from within outwards, you have the mucosa with lining epithelium, lamina propria muscularis mucosae, then the submucosa with some submucous glands, then the muscularis externa with the circular and the longitudinal layers, in between both of which you have the myenteric plexus, and between the submucosa and the circular muscle, you have the submucosal or Meissner's plexus, and finally the serosa slash adventitia. If peritoneum, then serosa, if no peritoneum, then adventitia. Okay, now let's see what exactly is happening as we traverse from the mouth to the anus. This is stratified squamous epithelium and it should immediately point towards esophagus because there is no absorption taking place in the esophagus. The esophagus is merely passing the bolus from the mouth to the stomach and when you're passing a bolus, you do not want a lot of friction. So you've got multiple layers and that is one of the most important uh, sites where uh, stratified squamous epithelium is seen. Correct? As you go from the esophagus to the stomach, see what's happening? These are these tall columnar cells, which are the cells of the gastric mucosa. Okay? Moving back here, the lamina propria will show a couple of uh, aggregation of uh, lymphoid follicles and a couple of uh, capillaries, which are going to be the capillaries and the lamina propria. But when you go here, See what's happening? The mucosa dips inside, dips inside. You see, these are all dips, which are obviously known as crypts. And what is around these is actually what is known as the gastric glands. Okay. So the gastric glands, they are lined by three types of cells. Okay. You obviously have the common mucus neck cells, but the other ones that we're really interested in are the parietal cell which is responsible for formation of hydrochloric acid. It has a very typical structure, the details of which I won't go into, but remember, write it down, parietal cell. Then you have the cells that are going to secrete pepsinogen, correct? The peptic cells, right? And you have what is known as a neuroendocrine cell now. You can read about it if you're interested. Neuroendocrine cells are present all throughout the GIT, later in the small intestine and large intestine as well. And uh, there are special type of cells whose granules are not facing the apical side, but the basal side. So it's very interesting because the rough endoplasmic reticulum is more concentrated below the nucleus. It's known as uh, infranuclear RER and infranuclear Golgi because the secretions of an neuroendocrine cell also known as an APUD cell are going to be secreted not into the lumen but into the capillaries uh, that lie in the lamina propria. Anyways, I divert here but it's very interesting you should read about APUD cells. There's a separate tumor known as neuroendocrine cell tumor which is very interesting. Read about it if you can. Write that down. APUD cell slash neuroendocrine cell. So anyways, gastric glands and the different types of cells found in the gastric mucosa. Okay, now I'm going to go down again and we're going to traverse towards the duodenum. Okay, the stomach of course, of course has a slight variation in uh, the fundic area and the pyloric area. There's a couple of differences. There's a table in your textbook, read about it. Uh, let's move on to the duodenum. Now what's happening in the duodenum is that the cells of the duodenum, which are known as the cells of the small intestine, also known as the enterocyte, is a very interesting cell because it has microvilli at the apical end for increased area of surface absorption. Uh, embedded in these microvilli 
coming out as uh, bristles of a brush are certain uh, carbohydrate chains uh, which are important because they kind of form like a protective layer thus protecting the gastric as well as the intestinal mucosa then the lining epithelium just underneath that in the lamina propria you're going to have all your capillaries and then the submucosa you see this B in the submucosa you're going to have what are known as Brunner's or Bruner's glands okay the Bruner's glands are uh, responsible for secreting bicarbonate rich secretions now you need to understand that physiologically speaking the pH in the stomach is more acidic because of HCl and the pH in the duodenum and most of the small intestine is alkaline. So where is this alkalinity coming from? This alkalinity is coming from the Brunner's glands as well as uh, pancreatic exocrine secretions. The reason is the enzymes that will be active in the stomach region and the enzymes that will be active in the small intestinal region are slightly different and they get activated in acidic and alkaline pH respectively. So try to understand what's really happening histologically from a physiological point of view as I'm saying okay now uh, we've reached the terminal end of the small intestine here which is the ileum and that's characterized by you see this box that's basically encapsulating a nice purple lymphoid follicle and these are a characteristic feature of ileum and these are known as Peyer's patches okay please write that down Peyer's patches uh, very interesting things they are actually uh, Let's just call them a bunch of policemen that are waiting uh, just underneath uh, the lamina propria uh, to catch any kind of fishy activity, right? Suppose there's a Ganpati procession going on and people are doing visarjan and everyone's getting drunk. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be certain regions where the processions take place where there's going to be little cops who are going to be standing uh, together to catch somebody who's going to be drunk and misbehave. You know what I'm saying? That's very similar to that. It's very similar to that. It's very amazing how the immunity functions work uh, in the gastrointestinal tract. They're known as uh, GALT, by the way. They're also known as MALT, Mucosa Associated Lymphoid Tissue. Anyways, that's a separate topic. As you go towards the large intestine, can you see these white little things? You know what these are? These are known as goblet cells, right? And the goblet cells essentially are white because the mu mucopolysaccharides are lost in dehydration uh, during tissue processing and so there's just like a ghost cell that is seen over here. Now they already start appearing towards the terminal uh, ileum and the number increases as you go towards the large intestine. Everything else in the large intestine pretty much remains the same but the number of goblet cells start increasing. You can again see a lymphoid aggregation here and the large intestine, right? So as you just observe, the lining epithelium is changing as you're going from the esophagus all the way down, right? It's different in different places. I want you to make a note of that, how it differs and why it differs. Uh, the muscular part as well, because in stomach you've got uh, an extra layer of muscle, the oblique layer. So you remember that. Uh, the submucosa, like I said, in esophagus and in duodenum is showing uh, glands. Uh, in the ileal region, the submucosa, as well as the lamina propria for that matter, is showing lymphoid aggregation which are known as Peyer's patches. Now these are just a couple of features, uh, but just try to familiarize yourself with some of these other things and try to apply yourselves while doing so. Okay? Alright. Now I'm going to go to the endocrine tissue that is seen in the pancreas and this is known as the islets of Langerhans. Pale staining islands lying in between the pancreatic acini and uh, these are known as islets of Langerhans. Now before I even begin, I want to speak a little bit about the endocrine tissue. Uh, here are some of the characteristic features of endocrine tissue. It's almost always capsulated. There's always a capsule and the capsule always sends in little fibrous septa inside. Uh, and these are the fibrous septa that divide the cells, the cells that are responsible for the hormone production into separate clusters or cords. Okay, uh, primarily in case of uh, the islets of Langerhans, this capsule is formed by reticulin fibers. Okay, that's a characteristic feature. And whenever you think of the islets of Langerhans, I want you to think of a pomegranate. So, I don't know if it's pomegranate season right now, but whenever it is, open a pomegranate and you'll see the yellow colored septa of the pomegranate going inside, right? These are the fibrous septa and then every little red colored pomegranate thing, whatever that is called, can be considered to be cords of cells and clusters. 
Now, in case of the islets of pancreas, the cells that are in the periphery are mostly uh, stained by acid fusion and uh, these are mostly alpha cells. So you can't see that because this is H&E, but the alpha cells are in the periphery, about 20 to 25% of uh, an islet peripherally is cons constituted by the alpha cells. Physiologically speaking, these are responsible for secretion of glucagon, can be uh, known as the expending hormone so every time you stop eating and your insulin goes down your glucagon goes up and that is secreted by these alpha cells right in the center you mostly have uh, cells which are known as beta cells they form about 70 percent of the islet constitution and the beta cells are responsible for secreting insulin which is the building hormone correct and there's a couple of other cells randomly interspersed mostly again in the periphery and these are known as delta cells uh, which are responsible for secretion of somatostatin and also gastrin to a certain extent uh, now one of the most important ways of identifying an islet is just look for pale areas when you're going through the slide of the pancreas correct and then if they ask you in detail about the structure of an islet start from the outside say that there's a capsule the capsule sends in fiber receptor and then there are cords of uh, cells or there are clusters of cells which can only be identified by using acid and aldehyde fusion. The acid fusion will stain uh, the alpha cells, uh, the aldehyde fusion will stain the beta cells. Uh, the delta cells are actually stained by argentafin, so that kind of does belong to the whole neuroendocrine system or APUD system of cells and it is stained by silver salts. Uh, which is a characteristic feature of all of these cells by the way hence they're also known as argentafin cells argentum meaning silver uh, remember this uh, if you use special stains now in case of this slide we've got uh, acid fusion which is staining the alpha cells with some pink can you see that these are the alpha cells and towards the center you mostly have the beta cells okay what I really want you to remember about any endocrine organ in, uh, for that matter is the fact that it has fenestrated capillaries now think of it this way an exocrine gland has a duct system to pour its secretions wherever it has to the endocrine glands have to pour their secretions directly in blood and the hormones have to act at far away places so the only way that can happen is if they have a rich blood supply so all endocrine organs are heavily perfused and they have fenestrated capillaries so the hormones can immediately uh, mix in the blood and create the effect that you desire it to cause okay so remember that uh, please read a little more about features of endocrine organs and then you can start applying these uh, facts to other endocrine organs that you shall study. You'll see that the suprarenal has pretty much similar structure. Uh, we're going to use special stains for chromophils and chromophobes and whatnot. Uh, the thyroid, uh, you'd probably have to study a little more about uh, the follicular cell and how it is cuboidal. It can be low cuboidal or high cuboidal depending on activity as I mentioned before. But just remember that now you have a basic pro forma of some of the uh, things that you might find yourself repeating when you read something else that is closely associated okay so uh, uh, that that pretty much sums up my lecture i think we're running out of time so i'm just going to quickly summarize everything now i want you to forgive me if you were expecting something very elaborate about every tissue and every slide in detail because this is not the time to do that and uh, how will I know how to, which subjects to choose? Like if you could interact with me and tell me if there's a certain uh, microscopic tissue or a histological uh, phenomenon that you want me to talk about, I'll go ahead and make a video for that if and when I get the time. But for now, to summarize everything, the most important thing that you need to understand about histology is that every cell has a certain structure for a reason. And the only way to find out why the structure would be the way it is, is to understand the physiology that is happening inside the cell. Is it actively secreting something? Is it not? What is the shape of the cell? Is it tall? Okay, why is it tall? Is it short? Okay, why is it short? Does it have any kind of granules? Oh, great. Why does it have these granules? Who is creating these granules? If it has granules, are they basophilic? Are they acidophilic? Do they need any special stains to identify the granules? Then when you start thinking about tissues, that is a group of cells that come together to form a tissue, it's always important 
to remember what the function of the tissue would be like. If the function of the tissue would be to prevent friction, you would go more towards like a stratified epithelium with like a, a dense connective tissue underneath it. If the function of the tissue is more absorptive, you would probably be having cells with microvilli at the apical surface. If the function of the tissue is more to put granules in the blood system but not in the lumen, there would be infranuclear Golgi, infranuclear ephendoplasmic reticulum, so on and so forth. If the function of the tissue is going to be conduction, it's going to have really long protoplasmic processes, which is uh, a feature of axons. But anyways, we're not talking about neuro. We don't talk about neuro in such situations. Uh, organ now technically the organ is when different kinds of tissues harmoniously live together to create a nice function right so you saw it beautifully in gastrointestinal tract how the lining epithelium the lamina propria the submucosa and the muscularis move together to create a smooth functioning of the gastrointestinal system thank you so much for having me uh, i hope this kind of gives you a little more perspective on how to approach histology and uh, please let me know how you found this any kind of feedback would be very valuable so i can improve my teaching style and get better at what i do uh, thank you so much for listening all the best for your exams here's hoping that they get postponed where's the camera where's the camera here's hoping that they get postponed uh study well and whenever you study don't think about the exams think about knowledge not information good night bye